Good needle handling skills are fundamental to successful spinal anesthesia. Good needle handling skills allow you to do two things. One, to advance a needle in a straight line along your chosen trajectory without letting it bend or deviate. Two, to be able to make appropriately small and incremental changes in angle and direction of your needle trajectory as you try to locate the interlaminar space. The challenge, however, is that we're often using very thin and flexible needles for spinal anesthesia, typically 25 gauge or even 27 gauge. We're also often using pencil point needles rather than cutting tip needles, which require more force to advance through the tissues, increasing the likelihood of bending or deviation of the needle. And these issues are magnified when we use longer needles, as may be the case in larger patients with a lot more overlying soft tissue. And for this reason, I often choose to use a 22 gauge needle with a quinky cutting tip in patients with difficult anatomy. The characteristics of the patient's soft tissues can also present a challenge. Ligaments in older people are often tougher and more difficult to pierce, requiring more force. And obese patients often have highly mobile tissues, which can contribute to inadvertent deviation. Here again, Using a 22 gauge quinky needle rather than a smaller 25 gauge needle is advantageous. In the following video clips, I will provide various tips for needle handling that I personally use to overcome these challenges. All of these are shown with the patient in a sitting position, but the same principles can be applied to a lateral patient position as well, just that the trajectories will be different. Let's start with the most common setup, a 90 millimeter 25 gauge pencil point needle inserted through an introducer. The introducer needle is inserted at the chosen skin insertion site, determined by either palpation or ultrasound imaging as in this case. Brace your non-dominant hand against the patient's back and hold the introducer hub lightly to steady it, but without talking it in any particular direction. Hold the hub of the spinal needle in a firm but relaxed grip and insert the spinal needle slowly, focusing on advancing it without bending and paying attention to the tactile feel of the tissues it passes through. If you pinch the hub too tightly, there will be an unconscious tendency to push it downwards, which will show up as bending of the shaft. If there is bony contact, withdraw the needle completely out of the tissues and into the introducer. It should feel loose. Then lever the hub slightly downwards to increase cranial angulation by a few degrees and reinsert the spinal needle. Do not withdraw and reinsert the introducer needle for these initial redirections as you can easily make excessively large changes in trajectory and overshoot the space. Repeat this as needed. If exerting a lot of force and I feel the introducer needle starting to bend, then I withdraw it and reinsert along a new track but again ensuring this is a very small change so I don't overshoot the interlaminar space. Now, despite my care, I've actually hit bone at a shallower depth than before, indicating that I've overshot and am contacting the upper spinous process. I therefore redirect downwards, but using the same levering motion to keep the change very, very small. And this results in me being able to advance deeper than I had before and to feel my needle engaging flavum. This patient had very narrow interspinous spaces, which we also knew from ultrasound, and it hopefully illustrates the degree of fine control that's needed in needle handling and redirection, which is critical to success in challenging patients. Next, let's consider how to handle a long 25 gauge spinal needle, which is often used in more obese patients. The length and flexibility of the needle can make it tricky to handle in advance without bending or deviation, as you can see here. The key is to hold the introducer as usual with the non-dominant hand, and using your dominant hand, hold the needle, not at its hub, but along its shaft close to the patient, and advance it by pushing intermittently in small increments. This will also allow you to feel the resistance of the tissues and get an idea of where you are. If you contact bone and need to redirect, 
ensure that you withdraw the needle fully into the introducer before adjusting the trajectory of the introducer and reinserting. This practitioner is doing an excellent job of ensuring the needle advances in a straight line and in a measured way that maximizes tactile feedback. The only thing I perhaps don't agree with is that he's not holding and controlling the introducer throughout the insertion process, and instead is relying on the patient's tissues to hold it in place. This doesn't work well in many obese patients who have loose tissues. Think instead of the introducer needle as your gun barrel, which you aim and hold steady, and the spinal needle is the projectile that you're firing through the barrel. You have to control the introducer in order to direct the spinal needle accurately. Finally, we come to handling of a 22 gauge needle, which is inserted without an introducer. 22 gauge quinky or cutting tip needles are useful in patients with difficult anatomy, as the cutting tip produces less resistance to advancement, which means less force needs to be applied, giving you greater control. The larger gauge compared to a 25 gauge makes it stiffer and less likely to bend or deviate. I'm going to illustrate the principles using longer 22 gauge needles, but the same handling principles apply if you're using a regular 90 millimeter needle or a larger gauge needle such as a 20 gauge for diagnostic lumbar punctures, which is inserted without an introducer. The needle can be held in various ways, with the aim being to advance it without bending the shaft. One way is to hold the shaft between thumb and index finger and to nestle the hub in the dominant hand so that you can apply forward pressure through the hub with the side of the ring finger. An alternative grip is to hold the needle like a syringe, gripping the shaft between second and third fingers with the thumb pushing forward on the hub to advance the needle. Regardless of the grip you use on the needle hub, the non-dominant hand always grasps the needle shaft close to the patient and provides a second point of control to stop the needle from bending. This hand can also be used to help advance the needle by feeding it in incrementally. If you strike bone and need to redirect cranially, you must withdraw the needle until the tip is no longer trapped in the tissues, and then using the second finger of your non-dominant hand as a fulcrum, pivot the needle slightly upwards before advancing in a straight line again. There isn't one best way to hold a needle, you should be adaptable. In this case, the syringe grip thumb push technique isn't serving my trainee very well, as the force applied is making the shaft flex rather than advance straight. So we shift back to a pinch grip of the hub just to hold it steady and use both this hand and the non-dominant hand which is holding the needle shaft, to advance the needle with a controlled incremental feeding in motion. As a side note, see how this patient is leaning forward and how we have adjusted the trajectory to angle downward so that we are truly perpendicular to their back. If you strike bone and need to make a redirection with a 22 gauge needle, you must withdraw almost fully out of the tissues to disengage the tip from the soft tissues. Note the tissue tenting as we pull the needle back, showing how embedded the needle is in the loose soft tissues. Use the non-dominant hand as a fulcrum point again to change angle incrementally and then reinsert with the same careful technique to ensure that the needle is traveling in the desired direction without deviating. When advancing a long needle in obese patients who have a lot of overlying tissue, it can be useful to intermittently release your grip on the needle and observe to see if the needle that you thought you were advancing in the midline is actually skewed off to one side, especially if the tissue resistance doesn't feel right or if the patient experiences right or left sided pain in the back. This inadvertent deviation can happen because the elasticity of highly mobile soft tissues drags the needle to one side and we unconsciously fight this, which makes the needle appear that it is traveling in a straight line when it is not. A light grip with intermittent advancing motions and focusing on keeping the needle straight will help. This last clip brings it all together. We've identified midline and interlaminar spaces with ultrasound and are advancing a long 22 gauge spinal needle in the midline. Note the very delicate and controlled way I'm holding the needle, which prevents me from inadvertently applying torque to the needle from my grip on the hub and thus causing deviation.
I also intermittently let go of the needle completely, which lets me judge that I am in fact driving it in a straight line along my desired trajectory. 